and not take much of your guys' time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and welcome to my talk. I hope everyone is enjoying the conference so far. Thanks to B-Sides Boston for having me. Uh, good that it went on virtual, but I really would have loved to have been there in person. Boston is one of my favorite cities. So uh, my talk is The Pentester Blueprint, A Guide to Becoming a Pentester. A little about me, uh, I have my CISSP, OSCP, and GWAPT. I'm the lead curriculum developer at Point3 uh, Federal. I just recently joined Point3. Uh, I was working as a red team lead at the company I left. I'm an adjunct professor at Dallas College, uh, the founder of the Pwn School Project, which is an educational meetup that focuses on cybersecurity topics and uh, mainly uh, offensive security. I've been in IT and InfoSec for 23 years this month. I've been pen testing for eight and a half years. I was featured in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book, which uh, the publisher actually reached out to me about writing a book. And so I wrote a book based on this talk and uh, that is due out in December. I'm also the co-host of The Uncommon Journey with Chloe Mistagi and Alyssa Miller. And so to go way back to the beginning of where I started, I like to share this slide because that way people can see that, you know, you may not think you're cut out to be a pen tester, but, you know, if someone that was a former pro wrestler could be a, a pen tester, then anybody can. So I started out out of high school, didn't know what I wanted to do for a career. So uh, I ended up going to wrestling school and was a pro wrestler for a few years, got married and needed a more stable uh, income. So I went to school, a trade school, to be a CAD draftsman, learned AutoCAD, worked in as a draftsman for, for a few years. And while I was working as a draftsman, I found out about sysadmin work. And it looked a lot more interesting than what I did. And the company I was working at, we were, this was back in 90, 95, we were being billed out at $30 an hour and making $15 an hour. This uh, sysadmin came in, was working our systems, and they were billing $50 an hour. So I thought, yeah, this guy's making $10 an hour more than I am, and what he's doing looks a lot more fun. So I kind of got more interested in computers. I did some IT-related work at companies I worked for because not everyone had IT staff. And so I really got interested in it and found out that I had kind of a, a natural skill for computers. So I've taught myself how to build computers, took a Nobel Netware, uh, Network Operating System course, got my first uh, sysadmin job. And that was in 97, 97. And then in 2004, I moved into InfoSec. I was doing network security, did that for about a year and a half. And they formed an AppSec team, and I got to move into the AppSec team. And this is where I found out about web application vulnerability scanners. I got to use those and then also found about pen testing. So pen testing really sounded interesting to me. And so uh, I worked, started out in consulting, worked in consulting for five years. And then after that, I've worked for a couple of different companies doing pen testing and more recently red teaming. So back in my wrestling days, I actually wrestled a, a 750 pound brown bear, which you can see in the picture there. That is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you, is that a real bear? Yes. Yeah, it was a real 750 pound bear. People always ask me, why did you do that? I was 22 years old. I'm a guy. What do you, that doesn't need more explaining than that. We do stupid things when we're young. It's just like, if you go back to the meme of why women live longer, this is right up there with it. But fortunately, <laughs> it was the same bear and, <laughs> and I came out of it okay. That was actually, that picture was actually the second time I wrestled the bear that night. And how I know is we got these, I got a t shirt because I did the best wrestling against the bear. And so I changed into that t-shirt. So that's how I knew which time I wrestled the bear because it was a yellow shirt. It said I wrestled Samson the bear and lost. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Were you on TV? Did you um end up being in uh gosh, I don't even remember. I we used to watch wrestling way back in the day. Yeah, um, I was on TV. I was uh, when I started out, I was in the WCW, which was like the former NWA. Uh, I wrestled okay. there and then I wrestled in Dallas at the WCCW World Class Wrestling where the Von Erichs wrestled. So okay. some of the most notable people I wrestled is Mick Foley. He wrestled in Texas as Cactus Jack Manson. Oh, so nice. Pretty big name in the, in the WWE. I got to wrestle the Road Warriors, a, a lot of big names. So it was an interesting experience. I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't change 
what I'm doing for a living because I really love really love hacking and what I do. But it, I'm glad that I tried it to see what it was like. So I, it won't be one of those things that what would have happened, you know. So, are you comfortable sharing what your wrestler name was? Yes, I just I just went under Phil Wiley because when you start out wrestling, you have to lose all the time unless you've got family or connections in wrestling. So. Uh, so I just wanted my own name because I thought if I used the gimmick, then getting beat all the time, it would take a while to get past that stigma. So my plan was once I got to where I was able to was winning and, you know, doing like the stars do, then I would, uh, you know, come up with a gimmick. But I didn't really want to run my gimmick, although I did wrestle once in Florida uh, as Corporal Chaos. I wore this this uh, oh, nice. cam camouflage makeup on my face and and had painted my wrestling boots camo. So it was one time I wanted a different name, but it was a lot of fun. I went to school okay. with the Undertaker. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll let you continue and then okay. we can talk more in questions. <laughs> I'm gonna see more people joining. So we gave people time to get in, so. Yeah, I was, that was part of purpose to ask the question. I was like, well, we started a little early, <laughs> so. We're planning, so no one, no one's missed anything, so. Yep. So now we'll go right into the content. Yeah. So All yeah, right. this this slide I, I share each semester in my my ethical hacking class, as well as in workshops that I do and and uh, different talks. And you know, make sure you have permission when you're you're doing any kind of pen testing or hacking, because without permission, it's illegal. So I like to share this this quote. I first heard the quote in Spider Man, and the the quote is, "With great power comes great responsibility." So just because you have the skills, make sure you use it for good and be careful because you don't want to get get in trouble. And I'm also part of hacking is not a crime. Hacking is not a crime is a organization that is trying to demonstrate to the public that not all hacking is bad. Hacking is needed for pen testing, testing the security of different products, that it's a needed thing. It's it's kind of like a lock locksmith. You know, lock picking is not a crime unless you use it to break into houses. So we're trying to help get the name back, you know, as a good name. It's a skill, it's not a crime. So, but it could be used as a crime, but we're trying to get that name back. The media has, over the years, they clung onto that term hacker. When hacker was originally makers, people building stuff, people, uh, you know, taking things and making it do things that it couldn't do before. You know, you look at a lot of these, these hackathons, that's the true spirit of hacking, you know, building things, coding, that is, that's hacking, although, you know, the the term that we've come to know outside the criminal aspect is is hacking in another another sense but it's not a not always a crime so if you do it with permission you know you're doing research you're doing it in your own lab then it's legal and it's not a crime so uh also along the lines of that mentioned the first slide that was that was um you know this court this whole talk came about from uh from a uh, my first class first day of class lecture so each each day of each uh, beginning of the semester, I would go through and tell students about pen testing, and then it kind of morphed to uh, adding what it takes to become a pen tester. People were in the class to learn, so it was kind of an overview of pen testing to get students familiar with that. And at the college I taught at, the other professors there asked me to come te talk to their classes and tell them about pen testing. And this was in January 2018 that I started teaching, and so by November. 2018, I presented this talk at B-Sides DFW. That's the local Dallas-Fort Worth B-Sides. And I gave the talk there. And since then, I've given the, given the talk on several different several different B-Sides, several different conferences, as well as webinars and to different schools. So that's how this came about. And then, you know, it's evolved into a book. So that book will be available in December for those that are just joining that missed miss that. So what is pen testing? Pen testing is a Assessing security from an adversarial's perspective, testing you know testing security the way a cyber criminal would try to gain access to you know sensitive data and systems, and so this is important because you're able to get to test things beyond uh, initial access to that system. Maybe it's easy to get into the system, but then you don't really know what you can do further. Maybe you're able to get domain administrator, get access to databases with sensitive information, so that's one of the one of the benefits so it's also understanding security from an adversarial perspective gives you a better understanding of the security risks exploitable vulnerabilities are higher risk 
and higher priority for remediation. And these usually justify budgeting. So if something can be breached, then companies are more willing to put out the money to remediate these items. Sometimes it's not, not uh, cost prohibitive. It may be something like changing passwords or password setting to make it more difficult to break into the system. But you know, it can get expensive where it may require some expensive software, maybe rewriting software or something. So, you know, doing a pen test, finding that the vulnerabilities are exploitable is a good way to justify remediation and get the budget to do so. And so uh, why pen testing com continued? Uh, regulatory compliance. It's required for payment card industry data security standard or PCI DSS. Uh, a lot of job opportunities because of like PCI uh, back in 2012, when I started pen testing, it was mainly consultants and uh, contractors doing pen tests. Most companies didn't have their own pen test team. It's kind of like you even go back earlier in 2000s, late 90s, when people didn't even have dedicated security groups. So uh, PCI compliance has really driven that. One of the companies, out banks that I work for, we had like 13 people on our team, as well as a dedicated red team, and they've expanded since then. Uh, Citibank, Bank of America, U.S. Bank, Capital One, they all have pen test teams. So this is one of the, it's an area that's continuing to grow. It's not like a totally new uh, type of job, but it's just something that hasn't really been utilized or needed. And so now there's a need for that. And as far as being a fun job, I still get a thrill anytime I hack a system. It's still a lot of fun, just as much fun as it was when I started. So pen testing jobs, so you know the long term of, of uh, pen tester is penetration tester. These are also, these roles fall under security consultants, analysts, and engineers. Not all HR departments have individual terms for every role. Sometimes they're just trying to more easily manage it. So security analysts and engineers, that could be your endpoint protection folks. This could be your firewall administrators, SOC, uh, and different roles that fall under that, under those categories. So when you're looking for a pen test job, you know, look at the job description. Some jobs are getting more towards the titles, including penetration tester or pen tester. And also be familiar with these terms. These terms are synonymous with pen testing. Ethical hackers is probably one of the most popular because this certified ethical hacker was one of the first uh, certifications and they use the term ethical hacker. It's a term that's more easy for the public to understand. So when you're explaining that you're a pen tester, sometimes it's easier to tell people that you're an ethical hacker or a professional hacker. So other terms that are synonymous is offensive security, adversarial security, and a very common group that pen testers work under at times is called threat vulnerability management. So when you're looking for a job, look at those, those terms and those departments for, for jobs. So pen testing skills is also helpful in other areas. Be able to determine malicious traffic, understanding the attacks is helpful for SOC analysts and network security analysts and engineers. Digital forensics and incident response uh, engineers, analysts can benefit from understanding the attacks because if they understand how attacks work, then that will help them in their investigation. And then uh, more common, some new uh, way that these skills are being used is in purple teaming. So this is where the defenders get together with the offensive team and the offensive team will launch certain types of attacks, just seeing if they can execute scripts on the endpoint or if certain attacks work, if like uh, Mimikatz or Invoke Mimikatz will work, if you're able to execute PowerShell on that system, just different things like that is a way to find those vulnerabilities that can be exploited and fix those. And sometimes this is a quicker way to get secure. If your offensive security program or vulnerability management program is not mature, then there's a good chance that there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So going through and finding some of these major uh, exploit paths and blocking them, you know, as you execute a script, you're being monitored. They see if they catch it. If they don't, then they try to tune their systems to detect those uh, those signatures and just work until it's detected. So this will go a long way of preventing a malicious actor into getting too far, very far into your network. And then application security. This was the area that I learned about pen testing because you're doing some vulnerability scanning there, uh, doing some kind of uh, vulnerability testing through that software development loss life cycle. So that's one area that is helpful. Understanding those attacks makes it easier for 
uh, application security to work with the developers to prevent those types of attacks. Different types of targets. So as a pen tester, you're testing variable, various different top, different targets, network, application, hardware, transportation, people and buildings. So network is a very common one and needs to be tested internally as well as external and wireless applications, your web app, thick client, mobile cloud and API. And these, the API is very important because your IoT devices and mobile devices use APIs a lot. Uh, hardware, so be able to test the security of hardware routers and switches, even from just like a per product perspective. So these companies are having their products as they build them, they're having their internal people test to see if there's any, any uh, security vulnerabilities there that can be exploited. Internet of Things and the medical devices I was listening to a talk yesterday and someone from the government had said that talk about attacks on medical devices that people attackers have actually bricked medical devices. So these need to be tested. I've done Wi-Fi pen tests before for hospitals where you can see the medical devices connected to the Wi-Fi network. So that goes to kind of a little scary there to think that if an attacker can get access to that Wi-Fi, what can they do from there? So we need to make sure the medical devices are secure. Transportation, so vehicles of all types, trains, planes, uh, different types of automobiles, trucks, with the, the autonomous vehicles coming, uh, we really need to make sure that those, those are secure because an attacker could take control of those and cause injury or use, use that vehicle by weaponizing it. And people buildings, this is kind of goes hand in hand with social engineering. You can have the most secure network, the most secure endpoints and servers, but if someone is able to get physical access, get into the building, get into your server room, get into a wiring closet where your routers and switches are at, it's gonna be a lot easier for them to, to breach a system. Types of pen test knowledge. So when you're testing a system, then you're either coming in from a black box or blind pen test where you have limited to no information on that. And a lot of cases, this is maybe just an IP address or just a URL. And this is more an, of an attacker approach. And the opposite end of the spectrum is your white box or crystal box test. This is detailed system information, accounts for each role and level, as well as even source code and documentation on the software. And these all are based on, you know, this all can be affected by the amount of time there is the test. So with the white box test, you can more thoroughly test the system in less time. With a black box test, it's gonna take more time because you're doing a lot of reconnaissance, detecting the systems and, and collecting more information on the systems so you can attack the systems. And the gray box is kind of a partial knowledge of both of these. And so this is what you more commonly see in a pen test. Usually it's gray box because you go in, the company wants to give you the scope of IP addresses or the URLs to test to make sure nothing get, gets missed. So all these have value. And a lot of times it's good to use a combination. If you're doing a web application pen test or any kind of application pen test, start out unauthenticated, black box style, test to see what you can do unauthenticated, and then go to the crystal box or white box test and use those different roles to see what happens. Can you elevate your privileges from an average user? Can you, you know, access other uh, people's content or other account levels at a lower level user? And and on top of that, you know, administrators don't need to be able to see social security numbers and sensitive data. So you need to make sure that sensitive data is not being revealed. So different types of testing depth, also different stages in a, in a pen test. Vulnerability scanning is not a pen test. It's part of a pen test in a standalone function. Companies will have a vulnerability management team and they will run vulnerability scans uh, reoccurring, you know, anywhere from once a week, twice a week, twice a month, or once a month, and look for vulnerabilities so those can get into the patching schedule, make sure the patches are working, make sure the configurations are secure. And uh, the next step is vulnerability assessment. So this is doing vulnerability scans plus vulnerability validation. And on top of the, val the validation, you're also running port scanners like Nmap to look for open ports, uh, looking for different services, maybe the vulnerability scanner missed, because vulnerability scanners do find false positives and they do miss things. So you want to make sure that they're that you're finding everything that's vulnerable. So you validate those vulnerabilities during the step, and then you find 
look for other vulnerabilities using different tools. And so this next step is the actual pen test. This is like a vulnerability assessment plus the exploitation, also known as hacking. And then you get to the red team and adversarial testing. Red teaming is generically lumped in with all offensive security uh, types of skills, including pen testing, uh, vulnerability assessments, which is really not. Truly, red teaming is emulating an adversarial uh, attacker. You're trying to gain access to the system, trying to go undetected. Part of this is also to test your blue team. You're also testing the, the people, processes, and procedures, making sure that there's something in place. If they're being attacked, are you able to block that? Are you detecting it? So that's a, a very important place there, uh, a very important type of test that has been overlooked because due to compliance testing, things have gotten more focused on PCI compliance, just focusing on you know, protecting the cardholder data, but not the whole environment. So some things get overlooked there. And this is where red teaming comes in. Uh, formerly, you heard, you may hear the term here referred to as uh, like an open scope pen test. And so this is a really important area and it's becoming more popular, kind of like pen tests where 12 years ago, pen testers, there really weren't that many pen test teams, but now people are starting to add the red teams and do the red teaming into their offensive security program. And their specializations. We kind of covered some of the different types of targets, but you can also specialize in these areas. A generalist, you're going to be doing network, Wi-Fi, some light web app. Your application pen testers, you're going to do web app, mobile, cloud, API, thick client, thick client, your executables, like your office running on your, your system or other applications before web apps got popular. There were a lot of thick client apps, but there still are, and those need to be make, tested to make sure that they're secure. Uh, social engineering and physical security assessments, these kind of fall under one, one category. So usually people do physical and social engineering, but there are people that specialize. Some people are, you know, are too shy to do the physical, so that's maybe difficult for them, but that's a very important area. Transportation and then red team, these are other areas of uh, specialization. And re red team, a lot, this is a good area for someone in general that's a generalist pen tester to expand into. And these, the physical uh, assessments and social engineering are used a lot in red teaming. So there's a lot of crossover uh, red teaming wise, some light web application. Uh, is helpful there too, but it's not like one of the main skills. Network is a big one. Understanding Active Directory, be able to, most uh, enterprise environments are running Active Directory. And how to become a pen tester. This is probably one of the most uh, interesting or most uh, topics of interest through this whole talk is how to become a pen tester. And so, you know, before I became an instructor, teaching pen testing, I mentored a lot of people and I would share my path with how I got into pen testing as well as tips on how to prepare for the OSCP and just different tips in general to become a pen tester. So first thing, first off, you need the technology knowledge. You need to be able to understand the knowledge before the knowledge before you can break into it. Understand the, the uh, technology before you break into it. Uh, you need to understand how to build secure before you can break. So Understanding that it's going to make you a lot better pen tester. If you get a command line to a Windows or Linux box, you need to understand that operating system or you're going to be doing a lot of Googling to try to navigate and see what to do. So under having this base knowledge is going to help you to be more successful and more efficient as a pen tester. So you need to understand networking, operating systems, especially Windows and Linux, and know them from a sysadmin level. So you're able to do networking. Uh, manipulate the firewall from the command line. Sometimes you get access to a system. If you can turn off the firewall, then you can do more things. Understanding security. If you understand how Windows and Linux security works, then you're going to understand how to breach those securities. Uh, application hardware are also helpful areas to, to learn. And hacking knowledge. Once you have that technolo technology base and your security base, then you got to learn how to hack. This was where I was at when I was becoming a pen tester. I had worked in as a sysadmin, I did network security and worked in application security, but I didn't know how to hack. And as a pen tester, you know, that's where kind of the, the term came, ethical hacker, you have to know, know how to hack. So I enrolled in the OSCP course, worked on that for about a year, got my OSCP, 
and it was like one of the best courses that I've taken. I was able to learn a lot. And at the time, it was more about the labs and the and the mission going through hacking all the systems. You know, that was the real value, although they've recently updated the content to that course. And it's there's a lot more educational content. Back when I went through it, you had to do a lot of research. There, not everything was really there. And now the course has expanded to cover Active Directory. So that's a really good place. So classes, as I mentioned, like the OSCP conferences, meetings and meetups, getting out there and connecting with the community, you're going to find some good resources, mentors, and people just to share information with you. Self-study. So build your home lab, uh, watch videos. There's a lot of good informational stuff on YouTube, a lot of tutorials on there. There's a lot of good blog posts and articles on the topic. And Twitter, InfoSec Twitter is a great place for resources. And you can find some really good people to follow. And the hacker mindset. So becoming a pen tester, you need that hacker mindset. And so this is kind of similar to troubleshooting. You know, how you install a server or operating system of any sort or install an application. And when everything goes smooth, that's fine. But then when it breaks, it's hard to figure out how to fix it. You've got to learn how to troubleshoot it to, to get it to work. So pen testing is the same way. You know, you try some attack, it doesn't work. And then you learn how to chain the attacks together. You know, that attack that didn't work, you have to figure out how to make it work. What, need, what do you need to do different? Maybe you try a different exploit. So learning how to switch exploits, learning how to chain the exploits together. So if you get like a uh, default credentials to like a Tomcat uh, Java server and you're able to upload a malicious file, what can you do next? If you get access, you're able to execute that shell. So you have to know, okay, what level user am I running at? If you're running as root NT system authority or administrator, then you can do anything you want to. But if you're just like a, a lower level service account, the way it should be configured, then you gotta learn how to elevate privileges. So chaining all that stuff together and just practicing that helps develop that mindset. And the hacker mindset is, is a, uh, combination of creative and analytical thinking. There's several areas in security. Most of them require some kind of creativity, but uh, this is one of the top ones as far as creativity. Just be able to put things together. The people that are coming up with the zero days, you know, this wasn't created before. They're able to, to exploit these things. And this is built off the knowledge they know about the target. So the best way to develop this mindset is uh, through hands-on hands -on experience. You know, bug bounties, your home lab, CTFs, and just repetition. The more you do it, then some of the easy exploits you're able to pull off easier, and you have that base built up. So once you get to the more advanced attacks, then you're able to get through the easy stuff and then spend more time on the uh, advanced stuff. So the pen tester blueprint formula, this, is, this formula consists of the technology knowledge plus security knowledge and the hacker mindset. So you put these together, then this is what, what is needed to become a pen tester. So where do I start? So you need to develop a plan. plan. And so what we wanna do is do a, a gap analysis. You look at the skills that you have and you look at the skills you need. So then you know what to focus on. So it all depends on what your experience is to what you need. If, you have, if you're an IT, then you may have some of these basics. Uh, no IT experience, you're just starting then make sure to take time to learn the basics. Like a lot of things, pen testing is a marathon, not a sprint. So you really want to make sure you spend your time learning the basics. If you if you go through things quickly, and this is one of my big mistakes that I, I do a lot, is I get so anxious to learn it and get down to the end, the good part, and I really skip some of the stuff. And then when I have to go back and do this again, then I've got to learn it over. So take your time to learn it. Understand networking and operating systems if you're wanting to, you know, if you're learning pen testing, then you can study more than one topic at a time. You think about the way uh, universities and colleges operate. You're usually not taking just one class. You could be taking a Microsoft server class and you're taking like a SQL database class. So you're working on multiple topics. So as you're learning this, it doesn't mean you have to wait to do the hacking piece until you learn the basics. You can kind of learn Windows networking and Windows operating systems at the same time going along with uh, the security piece of that learning content, looking at how those can be exploited. You know, some of the security content's only gonna tell you how to secure or find out what 
happens if it's not secure, how those different uh, types of uh, components could be exploited if it's not secured properly. And then for everyone, no matter where you're at, no matter what level, build a lab. I still have a home lab myself. Home labs are good even for experienced pen testers to test proof of concept code. If you have an exploit you want to try, it's better to test in your home lab because sometimes exploits, once you run them, and if it's not successful, it requires rebooting the system. So you want to make sure you have it down and figured out before you perform that attack. And so setting up your home lab, I've got three three main categories here, and this can be as granular, as different as you want. But my favorite is the minimalist lab. And my favorite is the, my reason it's my favorite is because it's portable. You know, you can put this on a laptop, you can take it with you on vacation. If you're traveling for work, if you just want to get out of, out of your home and go somewhere else and study, because sometimes if you're in one location for a long time, you get kind of burnt out. So sometimes it's nice to go out somewhere to a coffee shop and once COVID's over, then we'll be able to do that a little more freely. But just having the portability is nice because uh, one of the things I've started doing in my home to be able to focus, I've got a dedicated area for study and work. And then sometimes I need to get away from that work area. So I go to my living room and get on my couch and recline and, and uh, work on it there. So that be able, the portability is good. So the next step is your dedicated lab. So this is a, a computer that you just have your targets run on different vulnerable VMs. And so uh, you set that up and then you can take your, your attack laptop or desktop, whatever you're using is your attack system and attack those. So you're going across the wire. So it's more emulating, you know, network connectivity. And then you have your advanced labs. You can have individual components. You can have servers, individual computers, routers, and switches. You can even do this with like Raspberry Pis, you know, some the small form factor like that. You can set, install Linux on it. I think even the uh, Raspberry Pis are supporting Windows now. So you can set up individual systems and, and you can take like one of the Raspberry Pis and build like a firewall with it, set up routers and switches so you can get as complex as you want to. It's a good way to learn, but also if you really need to learn the pen testing skills and hacking skills, then you may want to stay more simplistic because the more advanced your lab is, if something breaks, then you're spending more time troubleshooting. So you need an attack platform. So you've got your your uh, system set up to attack. So you got to have it, uh, you know your tool set. What are you going to use to hack with? So Kali Linux and Parrot OS are two really great options. Uh, prior to this year, I really hadn't used Parrot OS much, but I'm becoming a big Parrot OS fan. Uh, Ubuntu with the Pentester framework. The Pentester framework is a utility or Python script that you can run that installs all the hacking tools like you would see on Kali Linux and Parrot OS. And this gives you a little more control over what you install. And especially if you like Ubuntu, that's a good option. And Windows 10, Windows, Windows 10 with Commando VM. Commando VM is a script by FireEye, similar to the Pentester framework. It, will, it automates the installation of all your hacking tools. And Windows is great too, because there's a lot of system administrator tools that are valuable for hacking Active Directory and other Windows uh, technologies. So it's kind of good not to depend on one to have Windows in your tool, tool set as well. And home lab targets. So for your home lab, you have to have targets. So VulnHub is a good place to find vulnerable VMs. Metasploitable 2 and Metasploitable 3 are really good ones to start out with. They have a lot of vulnerabilities in there. And I would say one, either one of these have as many vulnerabilities as probably you know, two or three other vulnerable VMs. And so this takes up less disk space, less resources. So that's a good option. That's where I would start out. Uh, there's a lot of good walkthroughs. So you can go through those walkthroughs if you can't figure things out. And the nice thing about walkthroughs is everyone does things a little bit different. So you may get some different opinions on how to do things. So building up that hacking knowledge. Uh, and Metasploitable was created by Rapid7, the creators of Metasploit. So it's a way for people to learn how to use Metasploit as, as well as you don't have to just limit it to Metasploit. But that's why it was created. OWASP WebGoat, along with Juice Shop and some other, other vulnerable apps, are really good targets to use. And then create your own VM targets with vulnerable software from ExploitDB. If you're not familiar with ExploitDB, ExploitDB is a repository of exploits, uh, different tools and scripts you can use to hack with. And so on there, they usually have links to the vulnerable software version. So you can download that version to use to test exploits or either build out you know, some vulnerable VMs in your lab. 
Another thing you can do too is you can find some study partners and you could build VMs so you can create VMs for each other to attack. So recommended reading. So here's some good books to get started with. The one I recommend to start with first is Penetration Testing, A Hands-On Introduction to Hacking by Georgia Weidman. This is a really good book. It goes through not only teaching you uh, hacking skills as a pen tester, it also guides you through building your own home lab. So you've got your own lab set up. So one of the advantages to a home lab is something happens, you lose internet connectivity, then you can still, still work away on your home lab. And the book I recommend second after that is the Hacker's Playbook, version two and three. Don't skip to version three. It's not just uh, a updated version. Version three goes into red teaming. So start with, with uh, version two and then move to the third edition. That way you get those skills. And this is a really good, you know, really good book and guide for someone pen testing. I mean, you could use this as a guide as a professional pen tester. And the Web Application Hacker's Handbook, uh, this is created by the creators of Burp Suite. So this is like one of the best books on web app pen testing. It's several years old now, not up to date, but it's still good, still a great book. A lot of consulting companies with their internships will will have this as required reading. I know NetSpy out of the Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota area. This is one of the books they give people when they're starting to learn web app pen testing. Uh, the Operator Handbook, this yellow covered book, used to the Red Team Field Manual was my go-to book for quick syntax on different uh, hacking tools and Windows and Linux and PowerShell commands. But the Operator Handbook recently came out the spring of this year. It's available in ebook, which I like. The Red Team Field Manual is not an ebook, and it's also printed. So I actually have a, the printed copy as well as the ebook because I like the portability of ebooks. It's got a lot of different syntax, so this is helpful for offensive security, OSINT, and blue team. So there's a lot of good information. They cover information on Docker, some different uh, cloud technologies. So this is a really good reference that I highly recommend. Sort of learning resources. So I've got the, you can kind of see where there's a little space here in the middle. And this is separating the top piece, which is paid resources from the bottom piece, which is free resources. So SANS Institute is some of the best training that you can get out there. Uh, they really do a good job of keeping things up to date, which is very important when it comes to learning content. Sometimes learning content can be behind and companies really, they try to keep it updated, but sometimes it's not that quick. I'd have to say SANS is probably one of the best about keeping their materials up to date. Uh, it's expensive training though, $3,800 for a two day, two or three day course, and then $7,200 for six day courses. They're really good. I've gotten to attend uh, three different SANS courses so far, and they've been really helpful. E-Learn Security and Offensive Security are really great learning resources. These are a lot less expensive. You know, this you're looking around the thousand to twelve hundred dollar range for training there. Offensive Security certifications, as well as the SANS, are really sought after uh, certifications by hiring companies. So those are great to have. Virtual Hacking Labs is good prep for the OSCP. Uh, Pentester Academy has a wide range of, of uh, learning resources as well as labs, and it's very newbie friendly. So someone that's new to pen testing, there's you can learn a lot there. And if you're ex experienced pen tester, then there's other areas that you can learn more. They've got some different things on hardware hacking, uh, Active Directory. Uh, they have some web app pen testing courses and their labs. There's like 1,700 to 1,800 online labs, and they're expanding that. And so Pentester Lab is another one. This focuses on web app pen testing, and it goes beyond just be able to do a, a cross-site scripting pop-up to check for the vulnerability. If there's a way to get a shell, they show you in this course. So that one I like because it goes beyond just be able to identify vulnerabilities. They show how to truly exploit those vulnerabilities. In Practical Pentest Labs, this is the least expensive on this list, it's $64 for lifetime access. You have VPN access to some vulnerable systems. They have a short course on there on pen testing and ethical hacking, and then you get to, to try test out that knowledge in the labs. And then we get to our free uh, resources here. BugCrowd University and HackerOne have great resources. BugCrowd has Hacker University, HackerOne has Hacker 101. They all have videos and learning content but Hacker 101 has an online CTF that you can actually practice and get experience. 
and they're trying to build up researchers, people to gain web app pen testing skills to join their bug bounty programs. And so the SANS pen testing blog, this is another great resource there from SANS. Uh, there are different cheat sheets and posters on different and tutorials on different tools and techniques. And then hackingtutorials.org is from the creators of virtual hacking labs. There's a lot of different tutorials on vulnerability scanners, Nmap, and Metasploit, really great free resource. And then OWASP has links to different vulnerable applications, the OWASP testing guide, plus OWASP Zap, which is a free web application vulnerability uh, assessment tool. And then you got to hack the box, try hack me, which is some vulnerable VMs that you can test your skills against. These are really good areas to spend time. Over the wire CTF and under the wire CTF. Over the wire CTF is Unix focused and under the wire is Windows and PowerShell focused. So um, you can get in, into these two and, and really learn Windows and Linux security as well as uh, how to exploit those systems. So those are really good places there to learn. And to find these learning resources, if you go to my site, thehackermaker.com forward slash learning dash resources, you can get this list of resources. And certifications, everyone's asking about certifications. One thing I'd like to say before we get into discussing the certifications is no matter what certification you go after, learn the topic, learn that subject, that content thoroughly, because if you're wanting to be a pen tester, you're going to need those skills. Also, going through the certification process, you know, the CEH and Pen Test Plus, these are question and answer based. But you, the more you not, you know, using an exam cram type or some type of uh, testing software practice test, that's going to help you. But what's going to help you more is to understand, because if you get into the exam and you find a question that you didn't have on the practice test, if you understand the topic, you're going to be able to figure that out. So make sure you learn the topic. Take your time because you're going to use this later on as a pen tester. Your intermediate and advanced certs, these are the ones that are going to help you get pen test jobs. CEH is widely recognized. It's an HR you know, recognized cert, as well as a DOD. It's on the DOD list of certifications. If you're going to do business, if you work for the government or do a business for the government, they like to have that certification. But for just real world pen testing, they're going to ask for the GPEN, the OSCP, the GWAPT, the advanced certs, the GXPN, or the OSCE. The SANS are question and answer type of exams. Although they're not easy, they give you uh, it's open book, but don't let that fool you. you you're going to have to understand the content, create an index to get to things you don't understand quickly because you're not going to be able to spend time looking through those books if you don't know the topic. So back to that subject of knowing the content. And then your uh, your offensive security certifications are going to be hands-on. So you have to actually go and perform a pen test and not just perform a pen test, actually hack into uh, enough systems to get 75 points for the OSCP. Uh, the GXPN and OSCE, these are more exploit and development and advanced pen testing, but these are really good ones to, to get. The OSCE is getting ready to go through a reboot. So if that's on your list, you'll want to sign up for that now because they're getting ready to redo the, the course. They're actually re improving upon that certification. Uh, their advanced web app pen testing cert and course is going to be one of the requirements for that. So there's several certs you'll have to have and courses that go, go through to do this. So it's going to be a really valuable cert whenever they update it, which is coming soon. Job tips. So, so you're looking for a job as a pen tester, and this is important information. A lot of this for any type of role, professional networking, go to your different, you know, meetup groups and, and conferences, get involved in your local community, virtual communities, uh, network with people on LinkedIn. Also with LinkedIn, make sure to update it. It's your online resume. Put all your skills on there. Doc, you know, populate it just like you would your resume. And this is going to get, this is going to get the recruiters to you any, or hiring managers. So make sure that you've got that populated. And also use LinkedIn professionally. Don't use it like Facebook. Uh, you know, sometimes people get on there and treat it like Facebook and it just kind of, you know, maybe the hiring manager doesn't agree with your thoughts or, you know, or your way of thinking, you know. So make sure you keep it professional and, you know, you keep the other topics to other social media, you know, keep it professional. This is like you're you're trying to, to 
you know, convince employers to hire you or people to offer you different opportunities. So uh, being professional goes a long way. Then interview tips. Make sure to prepare for your interviews. Look at the job description and then kind of look at your resume and your skills and look how you, you know, you're qualified for that. So make sure to study those topics, you know, be prepared to answer questions. It could be something you hadn't worked on in a while. Maybe it's something you hadn't dealt with, but go in and study up on it before that interview. So make sure on your resume that your resume is accurate and not to exaggerate because the, the uh, interviewer is going to look at your resume. That's their guide to interview you. They're going to look for questions from your resume. So make sure that you have things that you do on there and make sure not to put things on there you don't know because if you don't know Burp Suite, be prepared to answer questions on Burp Suite. Uh, know the OWASP top 10. Even if you're not going for a web app pen testing job, these are the vulnerabilities that you always get asked questions for. Understand the different types of cross-site scripting. Uh, you know, understand the OWASP top 10 in general, but also understand the remediation. Understand what you know what you're seeing there. Don't just memorize. Be able to explain the basics like the three-way TCP handshake and the OSI model. So a lot of times you'll get answered, asked questions on this. Sometimes more the senior management, you know, they haven't worked in these areas for a while, but they remember the basics. They're more familiar with that. So maybe the, one of the hiring managers hasn't worked in pen testing. So they're going to ask you questions based on their expertise and what they think you should know. And so this is my contact information before I became an instructor and start giving this talk. Uh, I did a lot of mentoring and helping people out. So feel free to contact me here. And so if we have any questions, I am ready to take those. Awesome. That was a great presentation. Thank you for uh, providing that. And I, I liked how you spoke very slowly as you went through your presentation. Um, it was easy to digest everything. Uh, one of the questions that everyone is asking is if they are able to get a hold of your slides. Yes. OK, great. Awesome. Okay, so the first question here I have from Jim K. It says, do you have an experience slash advice in getting an organization with vuln getting an organization with vuln management slash limited red teaming and a separate blue team sock to moving to a purple team setup, i.e., integrating pen testing with a sock? So ideally. Purple teaming is more of an exercise. It's something you do periodically. So this is typically like the company I recently left. We did a, a purple team exercise. And so what we did is we got together. It wasn't so much just the SOC, but, you know, we had our incident response people on because sometimes they know how to detect things and they're able to work with the people that do the monitoring and, uh, and that they're able to work with them. So this is kind of an exercise. So Purple teaming is some is an exercise you do periodically, and this could be as frequent as you want. Purple teaming is a really good way to bring up that security gap. So that's just that's something to recommend. You know, I haven't really seen dedicated purple teams. They're, they they could exist, but it's just combination of the 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 two things. But it's just kind of an exercise of getting together. So that's one of the things I'd recommend, and one of the things way to to recommend it is you know based on your vulnerability management program and the maturity of your pen testing program you know there's some there's i'm pretty sure there's going to be some security gaps there and, and doing these purple team uh exercises are going to help bring up those gaps because are you able to execute execute powershell or mimicats on a, you know the powershell version of mimicats evoke mimicats on a system can you do that you want to make sure that you're not able to do that execute certain scripts and do certain things so that's a quick way to bring that up but yeah that's one thing i, I would recommend uh, George Orchias has a lot of good information on purple teaming, so check out any of his stuff. He has a lot of good information on red teaming, but the purple teaming thing has become really popular. He works for Scythe now, and Scythe has uh, some command and control and adversary uh, automation tools that, that work for purple teaming. So check out his content. I would, would venture to guess you're probably going to find a lot of good tips on how to pitch that to your management. Let them see those topics. I mean, uh, a good thing, too, is to get management, if they're not familiar with it, just get them familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, because this really shows the need for offensive security and purple teaming. And also, it's a good script to test during your purple team engagements, looking at the different TTPs and how to perform those. 